Hi, I'm Ashley with Campbell. Thanks for investing your time to help your community be a great place to live. Before you watch the video, make sure to click the subscribe button so that we can help you make educated decisions as a board member. Okay, great. Um, well, yeah, this is a little bit different for me. Uh, today, I'm coming to you live from the Courtyard by Marriott Hotel. So uh, for those that have um, attended some of the webinars we've done over the years, you might you know, recognize me, but a little bit different background today. But anyways, uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, as Ashley said, my name is Will Simons. I'll be the one teaching the class. Um, the course is called Reserve Funding Methodologies. This is kind of a uh, part two, maybe a little bit more advanced material that builds off of what we teach in the fundamentals of reserves class. So hopefully a lot of you have already attended that one. Um, if not, that is available uh, in a recorded format. We've got that on YouTube. So um, we can send that out with the recording for today's class as well. Uh, we'll also be sending out a um, copy of all the slides. So please feel free to take notes as we go along. But um, you will get a chance to see all this material again. So don't feel that you, if you miss something, that, that, that that's your last chance. Um, we, you know, we talk about this being for course credit for our managers, but certainly board members, committee members, anybody who has a, a vested interest in association budgeting and reserves and finances uh, is going to get a lot of good information today. Uh, and then we're certainly going to have a lot of time for Q&A at the end. I should be able to get through the material and hopefully maybe 45, 50 minutes, and then usually we have 15, 20 minutes of Q&A after the fact. So uh, bear with us through the end and hopefully uh, that'll add some value as well. Um, I'm gonna turn my camera off here in just a second so I can kind of focus on, on my material and you guys can think and uh, focus on the slides. So let me advance to that. Uh, okay, I, I will take a moment just to introduce myself and our company in a little bit more detail. Uh, uh, my name is Will Simons. I'm the president of the Florida office for our company called Association Reserves. I've been with the company since 2008. Uh, the RS after my name stands for Reserve Specialist. That's an industry-specific credential that is only awarded to people who have demonstrated their experience and expertise in preparing reserve studies professionally. Uh, that designation comes from CAI, the Community Associations Institute. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with CAI, if not members. Um, as of right now, we have five total reserve specialists on our Florida staff and a few dozen more spread out around the country among our other offices. Um, personally, I have lived in both condos and HOAs. I uh, spent about six years on the board of my HOA in South Florida. Uh, oversaw a budget there of a little over a million dollars, about 635 homes in our neighborhood. And the reason I always like to point that out is because I know what it's like to be on the other side of the table. I know what it's like to be a volunteer, working with other volunteers, with committees, working with my property manager to help you know, navigate all the challenges of running a community association. So uh, for those of you out there who are new to this, um, welcome. For those that are, that are old hands of being a board member uh, or a manager, uh, I still think you're going to get a lot of great uh, content, a lot of great information from us today. So, um, so thank you again for joining. Um, who is our company? You know, basically, we are the oldest and largest reserve study provider in the United States. We've been doing this since 1986. We've completed tens of thousands of reserve studies for all different types of properties all around the world. Um, we have offices from coast to coast. We have actually more credentialed reserve specialists uh, on staff than any other company, to my knowledge. The majority of the work that we do, of course, is for community associations, which includes condos, HOAs, timeshares, uh, other residential types of properties. But we also have a lot of experience working with other facilities, things like office buildings, uh, schools, churches, resorts, worship facilities, so on and so forth. Um, our only job as a company is preparing reserve studies. Um, we are not an engineering firm. We're not an accounting firm. Uh, our, our bread and butter is, is to be this specialized consulting firm that's focused on doing one thing really well, which is to guide our clients towards a successful financial future. Uh, the way that we do that, of course, is by preparing accurate and reliable reserve studies that help those clients to see into the future, uh, to forecast and budget for major projects. So, you know, if we do our job well and if our clients follow the plans that we uh, design for them, hopefully the benefit to them is that they reduce the risk of special assessments and bank loans and other types of financial distress. So that's what we do. 
Uh, if you'd like any more information about our company, you can see our website down there in the bottom right, kind of in the tiny fine print there, reservestudy.com. I'll also have my email address up on screen later uh, when we get to the Q&A, but if you want to write that down now, it's W. Simons, so that's W-S-I-M-O-N-S at reservestudy.com. Okay, uh, with that, I'm going to kill my video, but uh, I'll give you a kind of an overview of what we're going to talk about today. So this course, this reserve funding methodologies course really is divided into two sections. Uh, the first section is, is gonna be fairly short, but important. Um, we're gonna talk about the philosophy or the reasoning behind why is this important at all? Why should you have reserves? Or in other words, why is it not okay for associations to just pass special assessments or go out and borrow money every time they need to, to take on a big project? In our last class, the one I mentioned, mentioned that uh, fundamentals of reserves class, we spent a lot of time talking about the concept of percent funded. Now it's gonna be very important to understand what percent funded means and how that's calculated and what that means for associations. So again, just to kind of plug that one, if you did not attend the prior class or if you, or if you need a refresher on that, we'll send out a, um, a copy of the YouTube link for that fundamentals class as well. But once you understand the importance of percent funded and, and kind of how to use that, um, the second part of this is gonna make a little bit more sense, this, this uh, methodology section. Uh, we're gonna give you a detailed overview of the two different funding methodologies, what we call the pooled method and the straight line method. So let's dive into our first section. Why, why have reserves at all? All right, so the way I always like to put this in perspective is to, kind of pose it as sort of a hypothetical question. So the question is this, what are reserves for? Why do associations collect reserves at all? And to be specific, is it for the here and now or is it for the future? So, you know, take a moment, maybe ponder that, cue the Jeopardy music in your mind. Um, okay, so once you've, you've decided for yourself, um, let's talk through the next part. Um, you, you know, back in the day when we always used to do this, Live, I would have people give me a show of hands and almost all of the time, people would raise their hands saying, well, reserves are for the future. Now I wanna make a critical point right here up front to explain that reserve funding actually is for the here and now, or at least that's how you should think of it. We think it's a misunderstanding to, uh, to kind of frame reserve funding as saving up for some future project. Now, the reason why that's not a great approach is because there's oftentimes a very good chance that the current owners, right, the people who live in the association now, won't be there by the time that future project takes place. So it's a very easy excuse to make. It seems to make sense to them that they shouldn't be funding reserves towards some future project that they won't be around to get the benefit from. But let's think of this in a different way, right? If you think of reserve funding instead as paying the current bill of deterioration that is happening today in the here and now, I think that's a more appropriate way to, to frame this issue. Think of it kind of like a pay as you go model. Now I'll just give you a quick example. Let's say that I buy a unit in a brand new condo building and the roof on that building is gonna have a 20 year life, okay? Now let's say I'm gonna live there for the first 15 years of that building's existence. That means I'm going to enjoy 15 years of use and value out of that roof, not to mention all of the other building components, the mechanical systems, the amenities, so on and so forth. Now, let's say 15 years have gone by, I wanna sell my unit and some new buyer is gonna take it over and they're gonna live there for the next 15 years, okay? So let's say I sell to the new buyer, five years later, after they have purchased the unit from me, remember the overall timeline, it's now 20 years into the life of the building, chances are good that roof is gonna to need to be replaced. Now this is where things get complicated. So if I had not been charged accordingly during the time that I lived in the building, right? Meaning I was not being assessed for reserves, I wasn't contributing towards the cost of that roof replacement through reserve funding, then the new buyer, right, the person who bought my unit, they're going to get stuck with the full cost of the replacement project, typically in the form of a special assessment. Now, at that point, they will have only lived there for five years, or you could say 25% of the life of the roof. 
but they're going to be asked to pay the full 20 years worth of its cost, right? They're, they're paying their share of the roof, their five years, but also my share, my 15 years, even though I'm long gone, I moved away. So if you're wondering, if you're wondering, well, so what, who cares? Well, if you're the second buyer, right? And you can, you can turn back time and, and you're deciding between two buildings to buy into, the fact that my association maybe doesn't have that healthy reserve fund that it should means that that person, you know, you, if that's you, the new buyer, you're going to be exposed to more cost and a higher chance of a special assessment, right? You're going to pay more than your fair share because you're making up for the years during which I was not being charged, meaning I wasn't paying into reserves for my portion of the life of that roof. All right, so uh, in our business, we talk about these as kind of the four you know, cardinal rules of reserve fund. First of all, expenses are inevitable, right? There's no getting around the fact that air conditioning systems need to be replaced, elevators need to be modernized, roads need to be repaved, you get the idea. Number two, the board is responsible, okay? They are the ones who are entrusted with managing the association on behalf of all their fellow owners, right? Next, when these projects get delayed, they tend to get more expensive. We see this kind of thing all the time, especially if you think of things like roofs, you know, concrete restoration, waterproofing issues, anything attached to the building envelope. If you let it go, it's going to magnify. It's going to get much, much worse very quickly. Now, the last rule here, the homeowners, right, the association members, they always get stuck paying the bill. Okay, there is no Uncle Sam, there's no government bailout coming for community associations that don't do this properly, that don't have adequate reserves. So just like there are these four rules for reserve planning, we talk about these as the four options for how to pay for these reserve components. And the first and best option, of course, is to have that healthy reserve fund, right? Everybody's paying their fair share. You spread the cost of these assets over the entire useful life of any one component. That is the most equitable, most efficient way to do this. The second best option is to pass special assessments when projects come along. Now, I think it's kind of obvious it should be seen as a bad situation when the second best option on the table has this skull and crossbones warning on that. I'm not trying to be dramatic there, but if you've ever managed or if you've lived in a community that has recurring special assessments, every time you've got to pay for something, Hopefully you understand what I mean by that. That's a toxic thing for a community to go through, okay? The next best option after a special assessment would be to borrow some money, to take out a loan, take out a line of credit to pay for a component. Now, the reason I have that one ranked after the special assessment choice is because, of course, the cost of those components will be greater because of the cost of the financing, right? You're, you're, you're getting hit with interest on that as well. Now, what happens if you don't do any of those first three? Well, then the only choice you have left is to let the property fall into disrepair, right? Things are gonna become obsolete, they're gonna deteriorate, they're gonna disintegrate. And if you don't pay any money out of pocket up front to deal with that inevitability, then of course the only conclusion is that you're gonna have a drop in property value. I, I say this kind of thing all the time. We've got a lot of clients, uh, a lot of buildings that are clients of ours that when they were built, right, whatever that was, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, even more recently, they might have been, you know, the nicest building on the block. You know, they were a 9 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10. Nowadays, they're a 4 out of 10, they're a 5 out of 10. They are very quickly being overtaken by newer, nicer buildings, as well as those that are maybe older, maybe of the same generation, but have done a much better job of maintaining their property value, typically by having a healthy reserve fund. Okay, some of the specific benefits of having these reserve funds starting at the top, you shouldn't have any surprises, or I would say at least a much lower chance of getting caught by surprise. Okay, if you're funding your reserves, if you're paying attention, that means you're tracking the remaining life expectancies of all your components, which gives you more insight, gives you the option to plan ahead and prepare for when they need to be replaced, as opposed to reacting, getting caught by surprise whenever something breaks and you need to replace it then. Of course, when you're planning ahead, that gives you the chance to shop around and select maybe from different providers, get more bids, put together a better scope of work. Having that time on your side gives you that option. You can also minimize costs in some case 
by working with various contractors. For example, maybe you talk to your painting company and you find out, you know, when is the most advantageous time of year to have your buildings painted? All right, we'll schedule it then. Another example of that may be something like elevator modernization, right? This is a very, very expensive project for buildings to go through. And the lead time for ordering parts for an elevator, I think the, the longest I've seen was 96 weeks. Okay, so over a year uh, of waiting time just to get the parts on site to do that work. So if you wait until the elevator completely fails, if it's obsolete, nobody has any parts for it, and then you start to put together a plan, that's way too late. You're, you're gonna put your, your building at risk at that point. So um, the next point about minimizing exposure, that's mostly relevant to the board members out there. What I mean by that is that if you are proactively taking care of your property, you're doing a better job of upholding your fiduciary duty. That will give you better protection against any potential complaints, maybe even lawsuits that might come from the owners. And of course, that all rolls up together. The last point on here is that if you're doing all these things, that will lead to increasing property values, right? We've, we've been doing this for a long time, and we can tell you for sure the communities that are doing a good job of reserve funding tend to have better curb appeal. They're more up to date with respect to their technology. They have more modern amenities than their counterparts that don't. All of that contributes to a better ownership experience for the people who live there which in turn makes them more attractive to new buyers, right? To that new generation of owners who might wanna buy in there down the road. Of course, we can say the, the opposites are all true. If you don't have a healthy reserve fund, you're gonna be more exposed to surprises, which can lead to higher expenses, more liability exposure, and possibly even declining property value. And the real problem, and some of you may relate to this, is that when communities get into this kind of vicious cycle, it becomes more and more difficult, difficult every year to break out of it, right? Once you get into that pattern of special assessments, it's like living paycheck to paycheck and you're, you know, you, you can't get a raise. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the best thing you can do is to try to get out in front of that, have a healthy reserve fund, have healthy ongoing budgets to ever, uh, to prevent you from ever falling into this, this, this cycle. Okay, so again, you know, I said that was going to be a fairly short overview, um, hopefully nothing earth shattering there, um, but let's talk about kind of the main heart of this course, uh, maybe what some of you tuned in for today, uh, which are the two different ways that, cal that associations calculate how to fund their reserves. So the first option that I'm going to talk about today is called the straight line method. The other term for this is called the component method. And the reason for that is because in this method, all of your components are treated separately from a funding standpoint. Personally, we've always talked about this being kind of the old fashioned way. You know, more and more communities are switching to the pooled method now. Part of the reason it is the old fashioned way is because prior to the year 2002, at least in the state of Florida, it was the only approved method, right? Now, the way that I like to characterize this one is that it is simple in theory, right? It, it looks clean on paper, but in the real world, when you have a big complicated property with dozens and dozens of components, trying to put this method into practice can get very messy very quick. So how do we talk about this method? How do we explain it? I think if you want to understand this, this straight line method, you can characterize each category of your reserve components or each individual component, if it's that detailed, as being funded by a separate bucket of money. Okay, so for now, for this exercise, let's assume that we're talking about a very simple property and they have these five reserve categories or these five buckets, roof, elevator, painting, mechanical, and pavement. When you're using this method at budget season, um, the, what you're gonna do is you determine the amount of funding going into each bucket, each category, using a very simple calculation. Basically, what you do is you take the cost of the component represented in that bucket, you subtract out any existing funds that you've already saved for that thing, and you take that difference, whatever the difference is, and divide that by the remaining useful life of that component. What we show there's RUL. The result of that calculation will then tell you the amount that's required to quote unquote fully fund that component in that subsequent year's budget. All right, so 
So let's just do a quick example. Let's talk about our roof reserves, our roof bucket as an example here. So if you understand that the total volume of the bucket, right, the total capacity here represents the complete replacement cost, right, the total cost to replace your roof, and you look at your existing reserves, the cash that you've already saved, the contents of that bucket, right, the empty portion, the difference between those is what you can call the unfunded balance, right? That's the remaining obligation. That's the amount that you have to collect over the remaining life of that roof, which again is just the difference between the cost of a new roof minus the money you've already saved. So if we put some real numbers to this, let's say that the cost of replacing our roof is $200,000 and there's 140,000 in the existing roof reserve account, that means our difference, our unfunded balance is now $60,000, okay? So I'm putting together my budget and now what I need to do is figure out how much will it take to fully fund my roof in my reserves going forward. So I take that $200,000 cost, I subtract the 140,000 in existing reserves, and whatever the difference is, I'm gonna divide that by the remaining life. Let's say that's three years. So I'll take 200,000 minus 140, that's $60,000 divided by three years, means that in order to fully fund my roof, I need to put away 20 grand this year and in the next two years, again, because it's got three years to go, to fully fund my roof replacement. In order to complete the budget, I'm then basically just gonna repeat that process for each of the remaining buckets or categories. Now, as this plays out over time, right, depending on how accurate your assumptions were for your life expectancies and costs, you can end up with a variety of different funding positions, right? Some of these accounts are very strong. They've got almost all the money they need. Others might be very weak, right? Now, the way that I characterize this is to call this an inefficient distribution of all of the association's actual reserve cash, right? Think, just look at it visually. They have all of this actual cash on hand, but it is not proportionally funded amongst all the things that it needs to be. Um, so in practice, that means that money is effectively locked up, right? It might be locked here for this one component when boy, wouldn't it be advantageous if you've got a big mechanical component to replace to take some of that money and move it over. Well, that's when things start to get very complicated. Some of the specific problems that I find with this straight line method. First of all, it's very often the case that there is no bucket. There has been no prior reserve fund established for something important, something like concrete restoration. Or the fund might be too broadly defined, right? So for example, quite often we'll see this one big combined bucket this big account that's just labeled as mechanical. And in theory, that's supposed to capture everything from security cameras to fire alarms to cooling towers. The reality though, is that all of those things have very different life expectancies, very different replacement costs. And if you just blindly combine them into one big category, now you have to start to do some pretty complicated math to find out how much is going towards each thing in that bucket, right? Already, you can tell from a management standpoint, this is going to become much more of a headache. Well, one of the other reasons for that is because under this method, the Florida statutes require that the owners have to vote to approve the moving of funds from one place to another. So, for example, say I wanted to move some cash from my elevator reserves to my parking lot reserves or vice versa, that requires the owners to vote and approve it. Now, everybody I'm sure understands that getting a quorum, passing a vote for anything in a condo association is a very difficult task. But I would say that's especially true when it comes to moving money around, right? What I've heard, what I've seen is that residents get very skeptical of their boards. They're very hesitant to give that approval unless they fully understand the situation. Oftentimes that means that the board, the manager has to get involved to call special meetings, you're sending out emails, you're getting your attorney involved to put notices out. It's, it's just a logis logistical mess. <clears throat> now, lastly, but I think maybe the most important problem with this method is that because it is more conservative, associations aren't making the most efficient use of all that cash, right? The sum total of all their available reserves is not distributed the way it could be that will end up costing the owners in these communities more money each year to properly fund them. 
Now, when we do kind of a year end review, we'll look back at all the studies we've done in that year. <clears throat> and we're gonna look at the funding recommendations for our clients that are using this method. When we do those reserve studies, we will always give them the recommendations using this existing straight line method. But we'll also show them what happens if they pool their reserves. And we'll talk about that in a moment so that they can understand what the difference might be between the two. And, and these numbers are pretty significant. So just as an example, <clears throat> last year when we did this, using a sample size of you know, hundreds of reserve studies, we found that the average difference was about 200%. Let me say that again. On average, our clients would require triple the amount of funding from their owners <clears throat> if they stay in the straight line method than if they were to pool their reserves. Now, I think it's a given, basically every community out there is trying to cut costs, trying to lower assessments. One of the easiest ways you can do that is to pool your reserves. Every year, more and more associations are making that switch and really never looking back. <coughs> okay. The good news is that there is a much better option, right? It's something that we call the pooled method, also known as the cash flow method. And in our opinion, this is absolutely the way to go. So just to put it in perspective, just to give you some more background, this method, the pooled method has only been approved in Florida since 2002. But what I can also tell you, again, because we're a national company, is that outside of Florida, this method is basically universal. Okay, we have 12 offices throughout the US. Our Florida office is the only one that ever has clients use, still using the straight line method. And again, to contrast it, you can, you can say that the pooled method is maybe more complex in theory, but once you get the hang of it, once you understand how it works, I think it's actually much, much simpler to use for budgeting. Now, one of the more common questions that I get when we teach this class is, you know, if we have straight line reserves now, but we're interested in making this switch over to pooled, how do we do that? So we put this slide to kind of talk through that process. First and foremost, I want to make it clear, the board of directors can create a new pooled reserve account all by itself. So for example, the board can say, look, as of this upcoming fiscal year, all of our new incoming reserve money is gonna go into this pool of funds. So just to be clear, that itself does not require any vote of the owners. It's only if the board wants to move money from those existing straight line accounts, those buckets into the new pooled fund, that is when the owners have to vote and approve it. Okay, it's basically seen the same way as moving funds from one reserve account to another. It's considered, the term for this is called a non-scheduled use of reserve funds. So the same voting process is required as if you were, for example, moving money from say painting reserves to elevator reserves. Now, the good news is that this is a one-time process. It's not like you have to take that vote every year when you adopt your budget. Now, if you're gonna go this route, I would highly recommend that you involve your association's attorney, your CPA, if you've got a reserve study provider, work with your team, okay? This is an important thing to do. It's absolutely worth doing, but you wanna do this with some professional guidance. I would say that that will give you a much greater chance of getting the buy-in from your owners than if it's just the board's idea to do that. So again, just to kind of talk through the, the uh, methodology here, the best way I found to explain this method is to go back to that same sort of bucket analogy that I talked about with straight line. Only now, just imagine that you're taking all of those separate buckets of money and dumping those into one big bathtub. Once you do that, right, you kind of, uh, you know, effectively remove the labels from any specific category or type of reserve funds. Now what you would have is one collective pool of money that is now available for any component that's on your reserve schedule, anything that's on the list. There's no such thing anymore as roof reserves or painting reserves or elevator reserves. It is all just collectively reserve money, which now can be spent, in my opinion, much more effectively, much more efficiently. So how do you do that? Well, the amount of funding that goes into a pooled reserve account is something that you need to calculate, but the, the first step of that process 
is going to be exactly the same as if you were using straight line, which is to develop a very good, accurate component list. Okay, the foundation of any good reserve plan has to be an accurate list of components. It doesn't matter which method you're going to use if your underlying data is not reliable. Okay, so once you have your list of reserve components and you have good data for life expectancies and costs for each of those things, what you can now do is look forward and design a timeline of future expenses. Okay, might look something like this. Okay, most reserve studies will include a, typically a 30 year forecast. And in that forecast, we're able to show how much money, what, what is going to be spent in each year over this timeline. And you can see it's not a consistent number. Some years, associations might have very little reserve spending. Other times, they might have millions of dollars to spend. But the point is, we put together this timeline so they understand what the obligations are going to be long term. Once we've done that, okay, once we know what those future expenditures should look like, the next step is to determine how much money needs to go into that pooled reserve account in order to meet those future expenses, right? Logically, that, that makes perfect sense. Now, this is a fairly straightforward process, how to calculate this funding amount, but I'm gonna talk you through each step. So the first thing, again, after we've established the component list, we put together the timeline of expenses, the next step you're gonna do is to determine the total cash on hand, right? What is the sum total of your reserve money at the start of this fiscal year that, you're com that you have coming up? The next step you're gonna do after you look at your expenses is to plug in some amount for estimated income to reserves, right? Um, how much had you done in last year's budget? That's a good place to start. Now, what you can also factor in here is interest earnings. So that to me is already a nice advantage over the straight line method where you can't really model future interest earnings into your income assumption, right? The next step, okay, is to look at that forecast of expenses again, right? You see what costs are coming up in the schedule for that first year. Is there anything that you're planning to do? And there you're just gonna do some math. You have your starting pooled reserve account balance. You add in your assumption for reserve income. How much are you gonna contribute? How much will you earn in interest to that pooled account? And then you subtract your reserve expenses, right? How much are you gonna spend in that year? And wherever that leaves you, that leaves the, the total reserve account balance going into the next year, you need to look at that amount and make sure you still have some money in the bank. If you don't, obviously, then you'll need to plug in a higher contribution rate because one of the hallmarks of this whole exercise is that we're not allowed to design a plan where in any fiscal year you run out of money, right? You can't go below zero. And we'll talk about that more in a few moments. But this may sound a little bit daunting, but if you're doing this on an Excel spreadsheet or any other type of software, you can model this type of cash in, cash out. You know, that's why we call it the cash flow method. You can model that for many years at a time, 10, 20, 30 years, just in a few seconds, right? And what you're gonna do over that timeline is look and see how your account balance holds up. Do you ever run out of money at any point? How much does your account balance grow to be? Right. And in the takeaway here is that you want to make sure that in each of these fiscal years, you're always keeping that account balance at a safe level. OK, now hold that thought for just a moment. This leads to a very important point. There are definitely differences of opinion over what people would call a safe level of reserve funding. Right. Again, just zoom out for a second. You're talking about the next 30 years, cash in minus cash out, how much is left over. That's what we're talking about. There are three objectives you can pursue when you're doing this exercise. I'm going to talk about these in this order, baseline funding, full funding, and threshold funding. So let's talk about the first option on the table, what we call baseline funding. Now, there's, there's no two ways about it. This is the riskiest option on the table. Now, it is perfectly legal to do this in Florida. But for most communities, this is not a good idea, okay? The objective here when you're baseline funding is you are figuring out what is the bare minimum amount of money that I need to be putting into my pooled reserve account each year in order to keep that account balance above zero throughout the entire forecast, right? The next 20 years, 30 years, whatever it is, 
what is the minimum amount recognizing that I'm gonna be spending money over time that I need to put in so that I never go below zero. So just to make this really, really clear, when I talk with managers, when I talk with accountants, um, board members, there's oftentimes, I think, a disconnect in the terminology here. The reason is that if you, you know, again, if you talk to most people in Florida and it's not really their fault, and if you ask them what they mean by fully funding a pooled reserve account, they will describe to you, or yeah, they will describe to you what I am now telling you is baseline funding. Okay, it's the minimum required by law unless you get a vote of your owners to approve something less than that. And that's really what most communities want to know at budget time. How much do we need to put into the budget each year so that we don't need to go out and get a vote of our owners to approve it? Now, the law says that that amount, that number that needs to be put in the budget to avoid that vote, that is the amount that would be required to keep a positive cash balance in reserves throughout the timeline, and anything above zero is acceptable. All right, ponder that for a moment. Um, this is the actual language that we get from the Florida legislation with respect to pooled funding. Um, basically says that your contribution rate needs to be enough so that over time, your cash inflows are greater than your cash outflows, but that's it. There's no other requirements to go along with it. Now, if you take the time to read through this legislation, you will see that the term fully funding is actually not used anywhere here with respect to the pooled method. The closest thing that you might find is the term sufficient funds. Now, as a matter of fact, the DBPR has a manual that they've published, which is a very common guide used by managers, by board members, that explains how to design a pooled funding calculation, right? So in this example, in this manual, this, this official publication, they give an example where they have a community that is funding reserves and they're modeling out, I think like 10 years of expenses. And in one fiscal year, they've spent all but $4, right? They leave their, their pooled reserve account with $4 left at the end of the year. And the state says, yeah, this is how you do it. This is sufficient. Now, before I say anything else, just put this as a rhetorical question. Does anybody out there, board member, manager, would anybody ever think that any size condo or HOA for that matter should have $4 in its reserve account and be happy about that, right? We certainly don't think so. Hopefully everybody recognizes that's a very dangerous approach to take. Why is that? Well, if you're just doing the bare minimum, right? If you're trying to you cut the margin so thin, it only takes one problem to completely blow up that plant, right? That can be some project that happens a bit earlier in the timeline than you thought, or costs a little bit more than you thought. The point is that if you're trying to thread the needle that closely, you have no room for error. And in those cases, the chances that you will need to pass special assessments or go out and get loans for these projects go up very, very high. So again, one of the main reasons to do this at all, one of the main reasons to fund reserves is to reduce the risk of special assessments and loans then I think you could very easily argue that baseline funding is probably not such a good idea. All right, if you look at this table here, this is a real world example of what baseline funding looks like. So I'm gonna start up here in the top left corner of the table. The first column from top to bottom on the left is all 30 years of this forecast of this financial plan. Now, when I move from left to right, you will see different numbers that start to correspond to each of these fiscal years, right? You've got your starting reserve account balance. Next to that is the fully funded balance as of that year, which we use to calculate percent funded. Again, I, I mentioned it a couple of times already, if you don't know what percent funded means, highly encourage you to go back and watch the fundamentals of reserves video or read up on it on our website or CAI's website, but it's a, a very critical piece of information to understand what percent funded means, okay? But once you know what percent funded means and how that translates into risk, whether it's low, medium, or high, we can start to make some prognostications about what the chances are for future special assessments, right? On the right-hand side of this table, you see all the cash flow, right? How much are you contributing to reserves? In this case, 70,500, whether there's any need for loans or special assessments, the amount of interest income, right, that you're going to be putting into your pooled account. And then what are you spending, right? So if I, if I just read this whole 
thing again from left to right. I have my starting cash balance, a million 107. To that, I am adding 70,500 in contributions plus 11,475 in interest. And I'm not subtracting anything, right? There is nothing set to occur this year. So this plus this plus this minus that gives me my starting reserve balance for the next year. So it goes up to a million 188, 975. In this case, the association is still in a pretty good position, but I have to keep doing that, right? I'm gonna run this out, excuse me, run this out over these next 30 years and see how this balance will fluctuate, right? As I spend money, the account balance goes down. As I contribute money, it goes back up again. As long as this cash balance never goes below zero. So in this case, we dropped it down to $245 as the low point. This would be considered sufficient reserves would be considered baseline funding, right? Now, again, this is not good. This is a, a position of strength, 89.9% funded that in about 12, 13 years becomes a very high risk position of weakness, right? This community has $245 in the bank when they should have close to 400,000. This is not a strategy for success, even though the state of Florida would call this sufficient, the owners would not have to vote to approve this plan. It's only if they wanted to do a lesser amount here that would send this number below zero, that's when the owners would have to vote. Okay, I've talked to you now about the minimum requirement. Let me go to the other end of the spectrum, the most conservative option, what we call full funding or quote, fully funding your reserves. Now I wanna be really careful here. When I am using the term full funding in the context of a pooled reserve account, I am using the definition that comes from national reserve study standards. Now, as I said before, most people in Florida have a concept of fully funding, which is what I just showed you. What I've now told you is actually baseline funding. Interesting history on this. So CAI, Community Associations Institute, adopted the National Reserve Study Standards back in 1998, right? That's four years before the state of Florida allowed associations to pool their reserves. There was already existing terminology. There was already well-defined objectives and for whatever reason, Florida didn't adopt those. They didn't make that you know, a part of the law. It would have been a lot better if they used the existing terminology, but you know, here we are. Now, this definition, full funding, right? The definition I'm telling you now means that you're setting a goal, a funding goal to attain and maintain your reserves at or near 100% funded, okay? Let's go back to that same example. Right? It's the same association as before, but now instead of seeking a baseline funding objective, this is what it would look like if they were fully funding, which is again, to attain and maintain that position of becoming 100% funded. Same starting cash position, right? A million 107, same fully funded balance, same percent funded, but now it's gonna require a higher amount, right? A higher reserve contribution rate to not only meet the expenses, but also start increasing this, this funding position, this percent funded level relative to their fully funded balance, which puts them on a track towards success that further and further reduces the risk of special assessments and loans in the future. It costs the association a little bit more money each year, that's true. But the benefit is that they are never ever in a high risk position. If I'm an owner in this community, the chances I'm ever gonna get hit with a special assessment are effectively zero at this point. It's another way to look at this, okay? On this chart, I'm looking at percent funded here on this left-hand vertical axis. On the bottom, going from left to right, I have those same 30 fiscal years again. Now, the different colored dots that you see here along the way, these are representing percent funded at different periods of time based on the different funding objectives, okay? So looking at the green dots, that is fully funding. They started about 89, 90% funded, gradually, steadily reaching their way to 100%. That's full funding. The orange dots represent the baseline plan, right? It gets very, very close to zero without going below, but they never really recover after that. What's interesting here is that actually for the first 10 or 12 years, they actually don't do so bad, but it's this big project right around here it wipes out that margin and they never recover. They, they never regain that position of strength. Now the purple dots here 
that is, um, you know, basically what we showed to, to show the client, look, if you just keep doing what you're doing, this is how that will play out. So the point is, um, if they were to just continue budgeting for reserves the way they had, they're going to bottom out, right? This actually goes below zero. They would need special assessments to cover their projects, and they never even get close to the position they were in before. So uh, the point here is that, look, we're telling this client, you have to do something different. You can't continue on the path that you're on. That won't be enough. But while you're at it, okay, here's, although this is the, the state recognized sufficient plan, why don't you seek a slightly higher objective that will further reduce that risk over time? So just to talk about that in terms of the difference in cost to the owners, okay? I showed you earlier the baseline plan required 70,500 in contributions, whereas the full funding plan was 94,500. Okay, that's a difference of about 34% which is actually a much more sizable difference than we typically see, okay? In most of these cases, the difference between baseline funding and full funding is more like 15 or 20%. But even in this example, okay? And, and this is modified after a real client of ours. In this specific example, that marginal difference, that extra, what, $24,500 a year, in this community that amounted to $15 per unit per month. Okay, so what that means is that less than a dollar a day per owner meant the difference between doing the riskiest possible thing and the safest, most responsible thing, right? So it's, it's really not that much more money to do this than this. You're already funding your reserves. We know that what you're doing already is not going to be enough. Why don't you just aim a little bit higher and you will greatly enjoy the benefit of doing that long term? Okay, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this last option because it's pretty simple to understand. Basically threshold funding means any objective between the two bookends, between baseline and full, right? So when you threshold fund, you essentially pick a target and you design a funding plan accordingly. So for example, you might say, instead of becoming 100% funded, we just wanna go to 70% or you can put it in dollar terms. We wanna make sure that we never drop below a million dollars in our pooled reserve fund, right? That is our, our artificial floor we're gonna set for ourselves. Now, one of the problems with this threshold funding approach is that it's a lot more subjective, right? You can have a board that in one fiscal year de decides that the threshold should be 50% funded, but then the next year a new board comes along and they decide that the threshold should be only 20%, right? That's gonna have a huge effect on the amount of funding going into reserves from one year to the next. Um, you know, usually when we do this, these are kind of unique scenarios. We'll design it for a client based on their input or if they just want to kind of play the what if game. But as I talked about on the last slide, if you're going to fund your reserves, it usually makes a lot more sense just to fully fund than to pick some arbitrary threshold plan anyways. It's not that much more money. All right, so one of the final slides, one of the final topics to talk about today is this, uh, <laughs> what, what I talk about as being one of the more frustrating parts of being a reserve study provider in Florida these days. Um, on the screen in front of you, I've got a paragraph that I copied from the Florida Administrative Code. Now, this is basically the state's official interpretations of what they have written in statute. In this section of the code where they talk about pooled reserve funding, they have this one sentence at the end which talks about the funding plan not allowing for balloon payments, okay? Now, I'm sure when this was written that whoever wrote it had good intentions. I think the inspiration here was to try and prevent boards of directors from intentionally kicking the can down the road. But the term that they used to make this point, the term they used, balloon payment, has a very different understanding in most contexts. Okay, the, the general understanding of the term balloon payment typically describes a situation where let's say you've got a mortgage and for the majority of the mortgage, the borrower is gonna pay a certain amount of money each month, but at the very end of the mortgage, the end of the term, they make one big final lump sum payment, which is much bigger than any of the amounts that came before it, right? You know, maybe it's 1500 bucks a month for 20 years, but the final month is $20,000, right? Now, if you were to think of that kind of approach from an association standpoint, it makes sense why that's not fair. Basically, they don't want an association to do 
the bare minimum, right? Put away a small amount of money each year for many years, knowing that at some point in the future, they can just plug in a much higher amount of funding in one particular year, let's say when some big project comes due. So for example, let's say you've got a townhome community that needs to replace tile roofs. That will almost always be the largest expense in their reserve schedule by a huge amount, okay? Let's say that that project is scheduled 10 years down the road. The board that's in position today might be very tempted to say, look, we can get away with doing a much lesser amount of reserve funding for the next nine years if we plug in in this spreadsheet that in year 10, we'll plug in a huge number that's just gonna cover all the cost of the roofs in that year and so be it, right? What they're essentially doing in that scenario is they're committing the future group of owners, right? The people who will be there 10 years later to pick up the tab, right? They're, they're having to pay that balloon payment. I see why they would wanna do that, right? It allows the owners in the present day to get by with a smaller budget to do a lesser amount of funding, but that's just not fair. It's not equitable. I understand why they wanna put a stop to that. This is the problem. Um, over the last couple of years, maybe three, four, five years, it's been brought to our attention a handful of times when we're talking with associations, we're talking with the accountants who do their annual audits, that the term balloon payment as used in this context has been interpreted to mean any increase whatsoever in the reserve funding amount. So for example, I might tell a client when I'm doing their reserve study, look, this year you should contribute $100,000 to reserves. That's based on our current analysis. And we're assuming that you know, things might go up a little bit in cost over time. Um, so to keep up with that inflation, you should contribute 103,000 next year, year two. And then in year three, if costs go up again, hey, you should contribute a little bit more to reserves. That, you know, that is the normal progression of things. For a long, long time, that was our approach, and that's how we do things everywhere else in the country. I think that's a very reasonable approach to take. But the problem we've run into is that the state has now said, well, wait a minute, no, no, you can't have any increase in your contributions to reserves. We think that's a balloon payment. And so we respond, well, wait a minute, you're allowing us, maybe even encouraging us to assume that inflation is gonna happen, meaning the cost of components will go up over time. We all agree on that, but you're telling us now that we're not allowed to assume any increase in the, in the contribution to reserves, the cash going in there from the owners. Now that's a major problem because if we all agree that inflation is real and that costs will be going up over time, but we're not allowed to make the same assumption on the other side of the model, right? That the contributions to reserves will also increase to meet those rising costs. Now it suddenly gets a lot more expensive to make this plan work, right? I'm allowing the assumption that expenses will go up, but not allowing the assumption that income can also go up. Now, remember, keep in mind, I still need to create a funding plan that meets these criteria, whether that's baseline funding or full funding. So in order to design a plan that has higher expenses over time, but I can't increase contributions, then I need to set the initial contribution rate much, much higher in order to make the plan work. That makes it unfair on the current owners. The people who live there now are gonna pay more than they should for reserve funding, right? So we've complained about this and the response has been, well, then just take out inflation, okay? Don't assume that components get more expensive over time and that should balance things out. And this is the part that drives us crazy. Okay, we are in the business of delivering financial recommendations to clients. We're now being told that one of the key underlying factors when making those recommendations should just be taken out of the plan. I don't think anybody in their right mind assumes that something that costs $10,000 today will still cost $10,000 15 years from now. The way things are going, it might not cost the same amount two months from now, right? There's really no aspect of the economy where that's true. But in order to make a reserve funding plan work, given this parameter, that is the only logical conclusion. Right? We have to take out inflation. We, we keep a level funding contribution amount for the whole timeline, which makes it a more appropriate amount for the first fiscal year. Okay, So where does that leave us? What does that mean for you guys out there? The message that we all need to understand is that budgeting for reserves is an annual exercise. Right, Every year you pass a new budget, every year you should have a new reserve contribution rate. 
you cannot have a reserve study done one year and expect that you can rely on those same recommendations for, this, for the next three, four, five years in a row if there's no inflation in the model. Every association needs to produce a new reserve schedule each year they will always be based on the market pricing for components at that time, right? That's the only way that you can realistically keep on top of things. In the same way that you have an annual audit done, you should have some sort of annual reserve analysis done. That doesn't mean that you need to hire a company like us. You can do this yourselves. The point is, look at whatever your data is and make sure you are accounting for the rise in cost that naturally occurs. And then from one year to the next, you can increase your contribution rate to reserves, okay? All right, good news is that, you know, doing that process is fairly straightforward. Once you've had a reserve study done, usually your provider can help you with that. There's lots of third-party software out there. If you just have a Excel spreadsheet, you can make this work. Um, hopefully this is not gonna exist for much longer, right? Hopefully this, this will go away. This balloon payment fiasco, this interpretation will go away and everybody doing reserve studies can make realistic assumptions again. But until then, you've got to be mindful that a reserve study has an expiration date. It's only as good as the data and the assumptions that go into it, okay? Okay, I've got one last slide and then we're gonna go to Q&A, um, but I wanna leave you just with a few parting thoughts, okay? If I've done my job today, I think hopefully everybody agrees that reserves are incredibly important, both now and in the future. Right? When you're designing your annual budget, think hard, choose wisely about which method you're gonna to use to do that, whether it's straight line or pooling. And then once you've chosen that method, hopefully pooling, make a smart choice about what the long-term objective of your plan should be, okay? Very, very important. When you're crafting the annual budget, the goal should never be to just keep the dues low, keep the members happy, right? As a leader in this industry, whether you're somebody like us, a property manager, a board member is out there just serving your community, it is our collective responsibility to educate the people that we represent, the people that we work with, and to help them to make wise financial decisions. So with that said, I've got, again, my uh, email address up there on the screen. If there's anything that that we didn't talk about today. If you have a particular question, please feel free to send me an email. Um, I see Ashley just launched the survey poll, so please um, go ahead and start filling that out. I'm gonna turn my video back on here and I'm gonna start going through the Q&A. So a um, couple kind of housekeeping notes. Um, I haven't seen any of these questions before. So uh, if some of these questions don't pertain to this audience, if they're not relevant, if I wouldn't know the answer without more information, probably gonna have to skip over those. If it's a legal question, I'm not an attorney, I can't give you legal advice, um, but I will do my best to answer as many questions as I can. I think we can probably go on for another 15, 20 minutes or until Ashley kicks me off or we run out of questions. So um, let me just start going down the list. Again, if you have additional questions, please add those using the Q&A button on your uh, taskbar. Okay, let's see. Um, after reviewing the new condo reserve mandates, sounds like pooled reserves as we know it will be ending on December 31st, 2024. <clears throat> the major mandated items are to be separate. They cannot be waived, borrowed against, et cetera. So it sounds like those of us that use pooled reserves <clears throat> will now be a hybrid style of reserve studies or reserve funding. I have, a, I have a feeling that a bunch of these questions in here are going to pertain to the new legislation that just came out, the Senate Bill 4D. So let me just give you kind of my uh, general feelings and thoughts about this legislation. First of all, this has been a very long legislative process that got us to this point. Um, our company was very involved in the process going back to last fall. Um, all through the winter, the early part of the spring, we had the House and the Senate in Florida coming up with legislative responses to the Surfside tragedy, right? That's obviously underpinning all of this process. Back in March, there were two versions of legislation that were on the table. You had a Senate bill and a House bill. And unfortunately, the Senate and the House really couldn't compromise on the key details, on the important parts of this legislation what would be required going forward? 
would reserve studies be required? Would milestone inspections be required? How often would those happen? Who's qualified to do them? What do they need to include? They were just butting heads, couldn't come to a conclusion. So they basically ended in a stalemate, right? The end of March when the legislative session, the regular session ended, no bill, no bill got passed. Immediately, I think you had a lot of public outcry and scrutiny and criticism from the public, from the media. And I think a lot of the legislators involved uh, took that to heart and said, you know, we've, we've got to do better. So uh, fast forward to May, uh, the governor calls a special session of the legislature to deal with the insurance situation in the state. At the 11th hour, um, with you know very little warning, basically caught everybody by surprise, they decided to reintroduce the condo reform bill back on the table. Okay, and in the course of uh, 48 hours or so, they came up with and passed a bill, Senate Bill 4D, which was then signed by the governor, which has a December 31st, 2024 compliance date. Very, very wide reaching bill. It talks about reserves, it talks about milestone inspections, it talks about disclosure of documents, and there's a lot of good stuff in there, okay? I, we, I, we generally are in favor of um, the disclosure of important information to condo owners, to potential buyers, to building officials, uh, getting these things out in the open is good. You know, making people uh, more informed, allowing them to make inf more informed choices is a good thing. No, no real issue there. The milestone inspections are very important. That's basically an expansion of the, uh, what was the 40 year certification requirement for Dade and Broward County. That's now statewide and with shorter timelines. Okay, if your building is more than three stories tall, if you are over 25 years old, your building's over 25 years old uh, and you're within three miles of the coast, um, then you have to have your first milestone inspection done and then every 10 years after that. If you're more than three miles from the coast, then it's at 30 years and every 10 years after that. I don't have any real issue with that. I, I think that's gonna be a big undertaking for a lot of properties. Um, and that's going to be a that's going to be a big cost burden. But I think that inspecting these structures as they age is very important. What everybody seems to agree is not very well done is this structural integrity reserve study part of the bill. So basically speaking, what what the structural integrity reserve study requirement is is every building, regardless of age, I guess I should say every building three stories or more. Um, needs to have a structural integrity reserve study done by the end of 2024. Just to be clear, that term structural integrity reserve study has not existed before. That was, that was a new creation as part of this bill. So it took what we have known in the industry as a reserve study for the last 30, 40 years and expanded that and added some particular requirements in there. For example, it has a checklist of things that need to be included in the scope of that reserve study. A couple of them are the foundation of the building, load-bearing walls and systems, structural floors. And it specifies that somebody, uh, meaning uh, the visual inspection has to be done by a licensed architect or engineer, that's another requirement that's never existed in Florida or anywhere else in the country, um, has to uh, give an opinion on the remaining life expectancy and the costs of those things, in addition to the roof and painting and waterproofing and a bunch of other things. But Let's just focus on the foundation for a moment. I don't know of any structural engineer or any other expert who can walk up to a building and tell you what the expiration date is for the foundation or if there even should be one. Now, this is not something you would ever typically replace, but if you read the literal you know, interpretation of this bill, um, it says that not only does that have to be included, but the association has to begin funding for it. They cannot waive reserves for that. So. Um, how that's going to be implemented is anybody's guess. I, I don't think it can be implemented, to be quite frank. That's one issue. The other is just the sheer uh, volume of buildings that would need to be inspected. We're talking about probably close to 30,000 condo associations in Florida that would all have to have this structural integrity reserve study done in the next 30 months, give or take. In addition to that, you've got about 16,000 or so that are old enough to also qualify for the milestone inspection. There are not enough engineers and architects and other professionals in the industry um, to meet that demand. So I, I don't see how that can happen either. All right, having said all of that, um, the bill that got passed 
by effectively unanimous opinion is probably going to need to be revised. Um, I've heard a lot of talk as you know as early as the week that it passed that there's going to be a new bill that gets passed. They're calling it a cleanup bill or a glitch bill that's going to go back and correct and revise, maybe extend deadlines on things, maybe change the requirements for certain things. Um, and that's, I, I don't see how that can't happen because the bill as it's currently written, I don't think is practical or even possible to implement. Okay, going back to the question. So one of the other stipulations in the bill talked about pooled reserves and um, the need to keep these nine things, I believe it is, uh, foundation, load bearing walls, floors, roof, painting and waterproofing, um, plumbing, electrical, windows, there's one or two more that those cannot be addressed in a pooled reserve fund anymore. The, the spirit again of that is that they don't want communities to use a big pool of reserve funds that they've already accumulated for something like lobby remodeling or buying new pool furniture, right? Something that's more of a discretionary expense. Now, that is a very, very hard line interpretation of that. It makes no provision or explanation for what to do with existing communities that have one pooled reserve account that are now in theory supposed to chop that up into nine pieces and start funding those in a straight line format. There's there's no real guidance for how or, or why you would ever do that. So I guess what I'm trying to impart to everybody is that yes, we have a new bill on the table, um, but it's not really effective for another two and a half years and everybody in the industry expects that a new bill is going to take its place, or at least a, a cleaned up, revised, modified version of this is going to, to pass. Um, I don't see how it can't. I think you're going to have just a, a tsunami of outcry from uh, residents of condo associations that are now being mandated to fund reserves when they've been able to waive them before. Uh, I think that's going it, it, to, I don't think, it is going to make people um, not be able to afford their homes anymore. Um, there's a certain percentage of that that's not such a bad thing. I mean, for the individual, of course, it's bad, but associations should not be struggling and playing to the lowest common denominator. You know, the, the, the you know, person with the smallest bank account in the building can't really dictate how things go for everybody else. So uh, there's going to be a lot more to come on this. We will certainly have more webinars, more articles, more uh, panel discussions to come. But for now, that's that's my take as a reserve study provider. So for those of you that do have pooled reserves and have always had pooled reserves, I would say sit tight, um, draft your budgets the way you always have. I don't I have not heard any legal, any accounting opinion as to how these things could be implemented. So um, I would say let's all stay tuned until next spring and, and see what to do at that point. So uh, long answer to a short question, but I hopefully that kind of addresses some of the other questions that may be coming up on the list here. Uh, okay, switching gears. With inflation affecting the cost of everything, yeah, absolutely. Is my 2020 reserve study no longer accurate or should we wait for the recommended five-year period? Um, a lot has changed since 2020. I mean, just in the last year, I think we had 25%, 40% increases on costs for certain components. Um, some of the things we've seen go through the roof in particular are HVAC components, uh, elevators, anything that has a significant amount of manufacturing that might've taken place overseas and where there might've been a supply chain interruption, those costs are dramatically different than they were even two years ago. So I would absolutely say that if it's been that long, um, again, not necessarily needing to hire a professional to do it, but you want to update those costs and, uh, and make sure you're always playing with the most recent data that you can. Okay. Um, ours is an older condo composed of individual villas. How do we calculate remaining life when the most recent replacement date varies from unit to unit? That's a good question. Um, and it may require a line by line, unit by unit approach, right? If you have, let's just say 10 villas, and the roofs on all 10 of those villas are of different ages, you might need to have 10 different reserve components in your in your analysis, you know, villa one, villa two, villa three, and they may all have different life expectancies, that would be the appropriate response. There's nothing wrong with that. Obviously, it makes things a little bit more complicated. But in order to put together your timeline of expenses, to make it as accurate as you can in that scenario, you would have to put together different life expectancies and different components there. 
Okay. Does our company have licensed engineers on staff that will be able to complete component reserve studies as required with the Florida legislature passed? The short answer is no, uh, we don't. The longer answer is um, I don't know of any reserve study provider, you know, a company like us that is primarily a reserve study provider that has adopted or adapted, I should say, to this new requirement yet. We have been talking with a bunch of engineering firms. We're trying to figure out how this could work, right? Do we go out to the property with a reserve specialist and a structural engineer and we do this part and they do that part and we bundle it together for the client? That is, that is one possibility. Um, we can hire licensed engineers, but I guess the, the, you know, the short answer is this is all so new and so fresh and such a deviation from the way things have been done for the last 30, 40 years is that this is not a change that can happen overnight, right? You can't become a qualified reserve study expert despite whatever other qualifications you might have in the course of 30 days. So, um, you know, our company along with really, you know, I, I think I can say effectively the, the whole reserve study industry in Florida is of a similar mind on this. Um, we understand what the legislation says. Nobody can really adapt to that or accommodate that at this point. We're trying to figure it out. Um, but everybody has the expectation that this structural integrity reserve study portion of it is uh, highly unlikely to stay on the books. Um, again, I think part of that is because it's redundant. We have milestone inspections, which are now going to be required, and those are good things. But I don't need think that you need to retread those same steps with a structural integrity reserve study, if nothing else because you don't need to or shouldn't ever have to actively fund for replacing the foundation of your building, for example. So there's just so many things in the bill that are not practical that, um, you know, we will adapt to whatever the new legislation ultimately is. But as of right now, uh, basically what we're telling our clients is to, to be patient and, you know, act as, you know, we always have or do a great reserve study for you that's going to capture all the things that we need to. If we need to bring in a structural engineer for some portion of that, we're gonna do that to the best of our ability. So uh, let's see, uh, some of these, and I think I've kind of already addressed, so I'm gonna to try to move through them and get to any new questions. Um, <laughs> I like this, what if our bathtub is not full of money? Well, I get that, um, keep adding to it. That's how bathtubs get full, right? A little bit at a time. Um, so, you know, if you're in a situation where reserves have been waived for many years, if you have underfunded reserves, I get that. That is very, very common. I would say in Florida, that's the, that's, I wouldn't say the default, but much more common than associations being very well-funded. The only way to put a stop to that is to, first of all, um, stop waiving reserves, right? If you're doing that, that's a, that's a terrible idea and start doing as much as you can and start to accumulate that over time. I would give the same advice to anybody who's saving for retirement, saving for college funding, saving for just an emergency fund for rainy day purpose. Um, you know, bite the bullet, understand that the cost of living in a community association requires reserve funding. Um, because if you don't, you're, you're really not saving any money. You're just going to get hit with special assessments or loans or have a drop in property value. So, uh, take an honest accounting of where you are and do the best you can to try to improve upon that. Um, let's see, um, mentioned before that inflation should not add into the reserve funding each year. However, we're in an inflation crisis. Um, with that being said, the associations uh, you know, that are underfunding, how should your reserve percent be increased in 2023? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously inflation is real. It needs to be accounted for. The only restriction, just to be clear, is on including inflation, or I should say, including contribution increases from one year to the next throughout a long period of time. Um, so you do a reserve study, you do a reserve analysis this year, you plug in a funding amount that's based on the current cost of things. Next year, next summer, next fall, when you're doing your next year's budget, you need to inflate all those costs to whatever their current amount is and redo the math, rerun your calculation to find out how much you need to fund from that point going forward. Um, if you're just looking for a very broad number, but comparing last year to this year, I would say a minimum of a 10% increase to reserve funding, you know, uh, should, be, should be something you're strongly, strongly considering. Uh, let's see. I'm looking at the clock here, it's 2.15. So I, I only wanna try to tackle a couple more um, 
let's see. Yeah, lots of questions about the legislation. I hear you. Um, it's a it's a challenging environment out there, and we're going to do the best we can with it. Um, here's one. Our components consist of road paving, runway depreciation. Uh, I'm not sure what runway might mean there, and taxiway maintenance. Well, maybe it's an airfield. If we pool, can any of the pooled funds be used for any expenses outside of these components? Um, no. Let me make that clear. If you have a pooled reserve fund, you are not creating a slush fund of money that can be used for any anything and everything, right? The, the spending from a pooled reserve account is still limited only to the items in the pool, in the schedule, right? So it doesn't create, as I sometimes joke, you know, the board can't throw the world's greatest New Year's Eve party with the pooled reserve fund, right? It doesn't work that way. It's still limited only to the things on the reserve schedule. Um, and let's see, uh, last question. This applies only to condos, not HOAs. I think that's probably referring to the Senate bill. Yeah, this is condos and cooperatives that are three stories taller or higher throughout the state of Florida. Uh, so yes, this particular bill does not apply to HOAs. Everything else I talked about today, the funding methodologies, the need to have reserves, um, percent funded, everything else does apply to condos and HOAs effectively the same way. The only difference in Florida is that unlike a lot of other states, we do have different statutes that cover condos versus HOAs. Most other states in the country, they're just collectively called community associations. But yeah, um, in particular, the, the Senate bill that I was talking about, 4D, that does only apply to condos and co-ops. So. I uh, haven't seen any new questions coming in. I'm going to go ahead and uh, say that we've, we, I think we've covered the most of them and I'll kick it back to Ashley. So Ashley, awesome. thank you again. Awesome. Thank you so much, Will. Great job. And as Will and myself, we both mentioned, I will be emailing out the presentation. We will have the recording for this and the fundamentals of reserves um, recording that we've done in the past. Um, I know Will, you guys will take care of issuing the credits for this, so I will send the attendee list over to Will, um, that way they can get that handled, and I think that's everything. Um, I'll be sending out Will's contact information as well in that email, so just look for that, and thank you so much, Will. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a lovely day. Okay, thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks for watching. For more great educational content, click the subscribe button now.